Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan Gorodnik, Director of the Department of City Planning. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. It's great to see so many of you uh, tuning in to learn about City of Yes for Housing Opportunity. Um, as some of you know, Mayor Adams announced this historic initiative in September. Uh, and I am really excited uh, to share with you that he is joining us uh, this evening. And before he speaks, um, I just wanted to say a few quick words about this proposal and why it is absolutely critical to the future of our city. To put it simply, New York City has a dire housing shortage that is making housing expensive and hard to find. We're not creating enough housing and the housing we are creating is concentrated in just a few areas of the city. One reason for the situation, outdated and complicated zoning laws that have limited new housing production. And when entire areas of the city are functionally shut off to housing creation, everyone gets hurt. Case in point, the vacancy rate for rental apartments is down to 1.41%. That's the lowest it has been since 1968. And the vacancy rate under $1,500 a month is functionally zero. This housing shortage leads to an imbalance of power between landlords and tenants. There simply are not enough homes for New Yorkers to live in, and it is driving rents higher and higher. Over 50% of New Yorkers are rent burdened, which means that they pay more than 30% of their income in rent. And in so many neighborhoods, these percentages are even higher. And without a credible option to move to another home, tenants are frequently faced with unimaginable rent increases, poor housing quality, harassment, and even homelessness. We don't need to live this way. We can create a city where there are options for housing in every neighborhood so you can rent or buy, you can stay in your own community or move closer to your family or to your job. City of Yes for Housing Opportunity is our plan to tackle our housing crisis by creating a little more housing in every neighborhood. It is a balanced citywide approach that includes creating more affordable housing in dense, high-cost neighborhoods, allowing modest apartment buildings close to public transit and along commercial corridors, making it easier for offices and other non-residential buildings to become housing, lifting costly parking mandates, and legalizing small accessory dwelling units to give homeowners extra income and to allow them to stay close to family. With this approach, we can make a big overall impact on the housing shortage without dramatic change in any one neighborhood. Now, let's just talk for a minute about timelines, and then I'm going to turn it over to the mayor. We've been holding these monthly information sessions since January, and last week, we released the Housing Opportunity Draft Annotated Zoning Text, along with an illustrated guide to the proposal. We shared these materials early so that people have as much time as possible to learn about the proposal, and I hope you will. You can check them out at www.nyc.gov forward slash yes housing opportunity. Once public review officially begins in the coming weeks, we'll bring the proposal to community boards, borough boards and borough presidents across the city, and we expect the city council to have it on their desks by the end of the year. We really appreciate your interest and your engagement. Please be sure to visit housingopportunity.nyc for more details. And if you have any questions after this evening, please do not hesitate to email us at housingopportunity at planning.nyc.gov. So again, Thank you so much for joining us. And now, if uh, if I may, it is my great privilege to introduce to you a champion for housing, somebody who charged us to go big and to leave no stone unturned 
in our pursuit of more housing and more types of housing for New Yorkers. Please join me in welcoming the mayor of New York City, Eric Adams. Mayor. Thank, thank, thanks so much, Dan. And uh, you know, forgive me for being in the car. I probably the nickname the mayor that's always on the go. On my way uptown to one of our town halls, number 27, I believe it is. And I think uh, Dan addressed the technical aspect of this plan, a city of yes. And I just want to keep it as basic as possible. Uh, it's, it's about Jordan. I saved up a lot of money as a police officer to allow him to go away to college, American University. And my goal was to have him leave without any student debt. And I was able to accomplish that. That was a very proud moment for me. But I sent him away to school so he could get an education and be able to get a good job and live in his community. But as you see it now, all of us who have sacrificed uh, for our loved ones and our children, they're coming back to a city that's unaffordable. And that unaffordability is due to a number of reasons. And one of them is the lack of inventory. We all know if you don't have a, enough inventory, it drives up costs. You have a 1.4% vacancy rate and even lower for affordable units. And so our children who are becoming uh, principals and teachers and accountants and other middle income and low income uh, are not able to live in the city that they love. And it has been unfair. We've had a housing policy that looked at communities and stated we were not going to build in those communities. Communities where you have excellent health care, good transportation, excellent access to good food, good schools. It should be shared for all New Yorkers and not just some. And so I know there's a lot of, uh, of, of trepidation about something new and such so big like this. And I would be strongly against it if, if it was talking about only building in one community. What Dan and his team has done is stated, let's build a small amount throughout the entire city so we don't oversaturate cities. Dan shared the num number with me today that was startling. 59 community boards, 59. Out of the 59, nine community boards have more of a housing, affordable housing, new projects than the other 50 combined. That is just unfair. That leads to gentrification. That leads to displacement. That leads to an overburden of infrastructure and resources overcrowding of schools, of not having the right uh, access to all these city, city services. It's just not fair. We need to turn back what happened during the 60s while we were fighting for the civil rights and equality for everyone, no matter what their ethnicity may have been. Uh, that civil rights fight now has, is at our doorstep. And we have to act accordingly, just as we fought for the rights of people during the 60s when this, these zoning rules were put in place. We, not, we now have to correct the wrong. I'm excited about this moment. It's a legacy moment. But it's not only a legacy moment for me as the mayor, it's a legacy moment, moment for us citizens that we're going to say no to unfair housing or the lack of housing in our city. For the Jordans of today, for our seniors who want to age in place, and for those new families that are growing in our city. But Dan, thank you. And I hope that we have good, healthy dialogue so that we can bring this plan to a city, not of no, but we've witnessed in many communities, but a city of yes. Thank you very much. Great. Th thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much for uh, being with us tonight. We really appreciate it and for your uh, your incredible leadership on this issue. Um, and uh, we're now going to turn into... Uh, uh, some of the back to some of the details, and I'm going to turn it over to Lara again. Um, and thank you for the opportunity here, Lara, to uh, introduce the program and to say a few words. And back to you. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you so much, Mayor Adams, for joining us tonight. We can bring back up the slide deck. We'll go back into some of the materials. Um, so before we start to dive in, I just want to make sure we have some housekeeping done. Um, we will start with a presentation. Um, and then we'll do the remainder of the time we'll leave for answering your questions. Um, if you've attended a DCP info session before, tonight's 
event is very similar. Um, during the presentation, if you have questions that come to mind, you can submit it at any time by using the Q&A feature. Staff will collect questions and queue them up for the live Q&A session. Once we start the live question and answer portion of the event, you will then have two options to ask a question. You can continue to submit written questions, or you can raise your hand. If you are on the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. When your name is called, you'll be able to use the buttons at the bottom left corner of your Zoom screen to unmute yourself. And if you prefer, you can turn on your camera as well. If you're joining us by phone, I will give further directions at the end of the presentation so we can unmute you. As usual, we'll alternate between written questions and those we want to ask uh, questions verbally. Next slide, please. As a reminder, instructions to speak can be found on our city portal, NYC Engage, which is nyc.gov slash engage under upcoming meetings. If you wish to participate in the meeting by phone, please call the one of the toll-free numbers on the screen and enter the meeting ID, participant ID, and password. With that, I'll pass it over to um, the team to start the presentation. I'm joined tonight by Veronica Brown and uh, Winnie Shen, who will present from the Housing Division at um, the Department of City Planning. Great, we can move to the next slide, please. Good evening. We're excited for you to hear about City of Yes for Housing Opportunity, a citywide text amendment that will change zoning to allow for equitable housing development. These changes will enable a little more housing in every neighborhood by removing barriers to housing growth. City of Yes for Housing Opportunity is a citywide plan that will encourage incremental housing growth over a wide geography. Next slide, please. New York City faces a severe housing shortage. The vacancy rate for rental apartments is historically low, only 1.4%, which is far below a healthy vacancy rate that would provide New Yorkers with appropriate housing options. Because our housing demand is greater than our housing supply, New Yorkers experience very high housing costs. Over half of New York City renters are rent burdened, which means they spend over 30% of their monthly income on rent. Not having enough homes is also the direct cause of homelessness. Each night of 2023, over 92,000 New Yorkers slept in shelters. This included over 33,000 homeless children. And these numbers are getting worse each year, in part because of New York City's failure to build homes for the people who need them. Next slide, please. Most of New York City's housing was created in the first half of the 20th century. Since that time, housing production has fallen dramatically. That's in part because of zoning that has become increasingly restrictive since 1961. While housing production has decreased, the demand for housing has increased. There's a number of reasons for this. For example, households are smaller today than they used to be, meaning even the same amount of people take up more space. Next slide, please. What recent housing production has occurred has been limited to only a few neighborhoods. In 2023, 10 community districts produced as much housing as the other 49 combined. When some neighborhoods stop producing housing, that puts additional pressure on the other neighborhoods to produce more and more new housing. Next slide, please. Proposals in City of Yes for Housing Opportunity emerge from the goals outlined in Where We Live NYC, the city's fair housing plan. Where We Live NYC was created by HPD in collaboration of over 250 community organizations. It highlights how the city's housing shortage and affordability crisis have severely limited New Yorkers' housing choices. In a tight housing market, landlords can charge high rents, and existing tenants are vulnerable to tenant harassment, poor housing quality, and displacement pressure as they compete with each other for a limited number of units. When there are few apartments to choose from, renters pay more. And these conditions further worsen the neighborhood-based legacies of segregation, discrimination, and concentrated poverty that have led to the deeply unequal city we have today, where neighborhoods have unequal access to resources and opportunities. Next slide. The average New York City renter household makes about $70,000 a year. 
but the average two-bedroom apartment in New York City is over 2,700. This means that your average working family will have to spend about half their income on rent to get a home for their family. Next slide, please. New York City's dire housing shortage has direct human consequences. These have been underscored in our extended community engagement process. Over the past year, DCV has met with over 100 groups, including housing nonprofits, tenants' rights groups, faith-based organizations, and affordable housing providers. Each of these groups was able to share a unique and valuable perspective on the lived experiences resulting from our housing crisis. Next slide, please. When New York City fails to produce housing, all New Yorkers feel the consequences. The housing shortage has detrimental effects on our local economy. Allowing New York to build more housing can also help to create good quality jobs in construction and residential maintenance, adding an estimated $58.2 billion to the city's economy and creating 260,000 jobs. Next slide. Many city agencies work on policies and programs that aim to address New Yorkers' housing needs. Department of City Planning is responsible for the city's zoning. Zoning regulates what can be built on a particular site, both how big the building can be and what uses it can have, residential or commercial, for example. Sometimes zoning includes other things, like requirements for income-restricted affordable housing. But zoning does not fund new housing or directly control what will be built. It only establishes rules for what may be built. How much housing gets built depends on many factors. Other tools the city uses to support good housing outcomes include subsidies or tax incentives to promote income-restricted affordable housing, programs for affordable home ownership, or tenant protections that guarantee New Yorkers' rights. Next slide. Changing our zoning can respond to these issues by increasing the number and types of homes available in every neighborhood across the city. If each neighborhood adds a little more housing, New York City can add a lot more housing overall without any single neighborhood experiencing dramatic changes or overtax infrastructure. Next slide, please. This text amendment is the biggest pro-housing change the Department of City Planning has ever undertaken, and we'll be touching the zoning for every single part of the city. The main proposals include the Universal Affordability Preference, or UAP, which will allow for bigger buildings for affordable housing in every medium and high density zoning district. Across the city, we propose removing residential parking mandates, which are making housing more expensive. We're also enabling more missing middle housing, or low-rise apartment buildings on appropriate sites in our low-density areas. We aim to help homeowners in our low-density neighborhoods by allowing them to add accessory dwelling units or ADUs to their homes and providing small buildings with additional flexibility to adapt over time. There's also a range of smaller proposals, including enabling the conversion of non-residential buildings, allowing more small and shared apartments, and allowing for residential campuses to add height-limited buildings. Next slide, please. Exclusionary zoning rules have made it virtually impossible to build housing in many low density neighborhoods, placing additional pressure on the high density parts of the city to produce more housing. This wasn't always the case. Small apartment buildings and two to three family homes are common in all of New York City's low density neighborhoods and were allowed in many places until as recently as the 1990s and early 2000s when stricter zoning was put into place to prohibit them. City of Yes for Housing Opportunity would reintroduce these modest buildings that are more naturally affordable than other types of construction, as well as apartment buildings at a scale in which they can take advantage of existing affordability programs. Together, these changes allow for the creation of more housing in low-density areas without impacting a neighborhood's essential character. Next slide, please. Our town center proposal aims to create more missing middle housing in low-density areas. Missing middle refers to a category of housing that's modest in scale and often affordable to middle income residents, a once common type of housing that's not often built in the city anymore. This proposal aims to re-legalize mixed use apartments or buildings with ground floor commercial use and a few stories of housing on top. 
This is a classic New York City building type that exists along many low-density commercial corridors. Overly complex zoning rules make it almost impossible to build new ones. This proposal streamlines zoning rules, including restrictive limits on floor area and height, so that it's once again feasible to build a single story of commercial below two to four stories of housing. Next slide, please. Our second proposal for missing middle housing is transit-oriented development. Transit-oriented development will allow for low-rise buildings, three to five stories, depending on the underlying zoning, on sites that meet specific criteria. So first, the lot must be within 0.5 miles of a subway or rail station. Second, the lot must be over 5,000 square feet. And finally, the lot must be located on the short end of the block or on a wide street, which zoning defines as being over 75 feet in width. Community facilities like faith-based organizations or libraries could also use these rules throughout the city on sites over 5,000 square feet where a community facility space is present. Our transit-oriented development rules would promote missing middle housing while also promoting sustainability by adding housing in areas with good transit access. Next slide, please. In the rest of the low-density areas, we wanna give homeowners more flexibility. Under this proposal, a single or two-family home would be allowed to add a small accessory dwelling unit or an ADU. There are a range of types of ADUs, including backyard cottages, garage conversions, and basement apartments. These small units will provide important housing options for small households, like a young person moving into their own place for the first time, or an elderly resident who wants to age in place. Because of their small size, ADUs also serve different income levels than a large single-family home. Successful ADU programs in other places, including Austin, Seattle, or the state of Connecticut, can show us that these units can give multi-generational families a little more space and help middle-class homeowners manage their household expenses. The proposal includes rules to ensure that ADUs are safe. New basement ADUs will not be allowed in the, in the coastal floodplain, and no ADUs will be allowed in special coastal risk districts, which are the areas of our city with the most severe flood risk. Outside of these coastal areas, basement ADUs may be subject to additional regulations or review. Next slide, please. The same rule changes that enable ADUs could also help homeowners who don't want to add an ADU, but need more flexibility to adapt or renovate their homes to meet their needs. Our research shows us that many existing buildings are out of compliance, which means they're not in line with today's zoning rules. So for example, our 4 one districts are two family districts that allow semi-detached buildings like what you see here. But buildings like these pre-1961 duplexes could not be constructed today because they have more square footage than is currently allowed and their rear yards are too small. These non-compliances end up causing big headaches for homeowners if they need to borrow money from the bank or if they wanna make simple changes to their home like renovating an outdated kitchen. We wanna fix these rules and that'll have dual benefits. First, homeowners of existing buildings won't run into issues when they go to make an alteration to their building because the zoning will better match what's actually on the ground. Second, you'd actually be able to build a two-family home in a two-family district or a multi-family home in a multi-family district, when today the only thing that would be feasible is a single-family home. Next slide. Next, we're going to turn our attention to the medium and high-density areas of New York City, where our focus is on creating more opportunities for housing, including affordable housing. The primary proposal for accomplishing this is a Universal Affordability Preference, or UAP. And this will allow for every building to be about 20% bigger, so long as all of that extra space is occupied by permanently affordable or supportive housing. UAP is modeled after current rules in some neighborhoods that allow for bigger buildings for affordable senior housing. The proposal will allow for incremental housing growth in neighborhoods and encourage affordable housing throughout the city, rather than concentrating it in a few neighborhoods. Next slide, please. This map shows which districts have existing senior housing preference today in the light orange on the map. Through the UAP framework, all forms of affordable and supportive housing will be able to take advantage of the higher FARs already provided to affordable senior housing in these districts. However, there are a few districts that don't have the senior housing preference today, shown in dark orange on the map. 
In these areas, we create new FARs to enable the growth of affordable and supportive housing in every neighborhood. We also wanna make sure that zoning provides room to build the extra affordable housing allowed through universal affordability preference. So we'll increase height limits where it is necessary to make enough room for these affordable homes. Next slide, please. So what does affordability mean for UAP? UAP will have an affordability requirement of 60% area medium income, or AMI. AMI is a measure of affordability established by the federal government. At 60% AMI, which is about 76,000 for a family of three, UAP will serve lower income New Yorkers than the existing zoning tool called Voluntary Inclusionary Housing, or VIH. UAP will place the Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program, but Mandatory Inclusionary Housing, or MIH, which requires a percentage of new developments to be income restrictive affordable housing, will continue to exist and be mapped when there are significant increases in residential density. UAP will also serve New Yorkers at even lower income levels through income averaging. Income averaging means that instead of only including homes at the required affordability level, a building can include homes at a range of incomes that average to the required affordability level. So for example, a building can meet UAP's 60% AMI affordability level by including a mix of homes at 30% AMI or about 38,000 for a family of three 60% AMI, again, 76,000 for a family of three, and 90% AMI, about 114,000 for a family of three. And in terms of rents, the maximum rent for a two bedroom apartment for a family earning 60% AMI would be $1,900. Through UAP's deeper affordability requirement and the introduction of income averaging, UAP can help to serve the low-income New Yorkers who most need affordable housing. Next slide, please. Here is one example of how universal affordability preference works. If a church located in our 6th district wants to build affordable housing today, they get 3.0 FAR, regardless of whether they're building market rate or affordable housing. This will allow them to build about 35 units. Under UAP, they get 3.9 FAR, but the additional 0.9 FAR can only be used for affordable housing. If it is, they can build about 10 to 12 more affordable units. 10 to 12 more affordable units may not sound like a lot, but this is functioning at a citywide scale. If every project has a few more affordable units, we can add a significant amount of affordable housing and no single neighborhood will experience drastic changes. Next slide, please. This is a rendering of how UAP will play out. Without UAP, the building is built according to the base FAR for market rate housing. The result is this eight-story apartment building. With UAP, the building can be about 20% bigger, which for this example translates to an additional two stories, so long as the extra space is permanently affordable housing. UAP can make a big impact on our housing crisis. In our initial calculations, we found that had UAP been in place since 2014, with tax incentives and public subsidies fully in support, an additional 20,000 income-restricted affordable homes could have been created and housed up to 50,000 New Yorkers. Next slide, please. Finally, I'm going to present our parking proposals. We will be making parking optional for new housing everywhere, following the example of many other major cities. Today, New York City requires new housing to include off-street parking, even where it's not needed. These mandates mean less space for housing and increased construction costs, which results in less housing being built. The diagram on the slide represents how parking takes up a lot of space. Two parking spaces is equivalent to the size of a studio apartment. Building parking itself is also expensive and is an obstacle to housing growth, 
especially affordable housing. We want to prioritize housing over parking. Parking will still be allowed, and we anticipate that developers will respond to market needs and continue to provide parking in areas where there is demand. By removing parking mandates, we can help reduce the cost of housing construction and enable development of more homes in each new building. Next slide, please. This example shows how lifting parking mandates can support housing growth. A developer sees his underutilized lot that's in a great location near a train and wants to turn it into an apartment building. The site could fit 16 homes, but the developer stops at just 10 homes so they can waive out of the parking requirements. As soon as they add that 11th apartment, he would need to provide six parking spaces. By eliminating parking mandates, the developer can fully build out the lot to include those six additional apartments. Again, six additional apartments may not seem significant, but when hundreds of sites across the city are able to build more housing, that incremental change results in a lot more housing for New Yorkers. Next slide, please. There are additional proposals that provide for more housing and a wider range of housing types. Firstly, conversions. Today, outdated rules prevent underused non-residential buildings like offices from converting to housing. For example, many buildings are built after 1961 or are located outside the city's largest office centers cannot be converted to housing. City of Yes for Housing Opportunity would make it easier for underused non-residential buildings such as offices to be converted into housing. To do this, we'd make a few changes to existing adaptive reuse regulations. Firstly, we want to expand these regulations citywide to go beyond office districts. That way, a broader range of underused buildings like vacant schools or former religious buildings can be converted into housing. Second, we want to move the eligibility cutoff date from 1961 or 1977 to 1990. And this allows for more recently constructed buildings to be converted into housing. Third, we want to enable conversions to all types of housing, including supportive housing, shared housing, and dormitories. As shown in the second image, we will also allow small and shared apartments through eliminating the dwelling unit factor, a measure of the minimum average unit size and areas of the best transit access. This will provide more housing opportunities for New Yorkers who want to live alone, but do not have that option. Today, we force too many people who want to live alone to find roommates to afford rent, and they end up taking family size units in many parts of the city. By enabling more small and shared apartments can relieve some of the pressure on those family size units. Finally, previous development often took place under tower in the park style regulations called height factor. Although we've developed a more recent set of regulations called quality housing, that have height limits and result in better design buildings. Some sites like NYCHA campuses and irregularly shaped lots can't access those new rules. Our final proposal would allow for height limited infill on sites that would otherwise be forced to develop tall skinny buildings or nothing at all. Next slide, please. The changes that we walk through tonight are the most significant proposals in City of Yes for Housing Opportunity. Overall, this text amendment aims to create a little more housing everywhere so that each neighborhood does its part to address our city's housing needs. And a few neighborhoods don't have to feel the intense pressure that they do today. It's not just about more housing though, it's also about more types of housing. Multifamily housing where it's currently not allowed because of exclusionary zoning, homes of different sizes to meet different people's needs, and crucially, far more affordable and supportive housing. Next slide, please. Thank you all so much for listening tonight and attending our final info session. We look forward to your questions and comments and hope you can attend your local community board meetings on the proposal when the text amendment enters the formal public review process at the end of April. You can also find more information, including recordings of previous info sessions, as well as other ways to stay informed on our website, nyc.gov slash yes, housing opportunity. I'm gonna pass it to Lara. Thank you so much, Winnie, and thank you, Veronica.
I'm going to ask Veronica and Winnie and um, the head of our housing division at DCP, John Manchin, to come on camera. Um, and we can thank you for checking the slide deck. Um, so let me just go over the um, how to raise your hand again. Sorry. Okay, so we're moving into the Q&A portion of this evening, and there's a lot of people here tonight, and a lot of questions um, have been submitted already. So just to give you ground rules, we'll be alternating between answering questions from attendees um, who've submitted Q&A through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, as well as with people who have raised their hands. Um, to ask your question out loud, please raise your hand. Um, we will unmute you and um, we will promote you to be able to unmute yourself and to ask the question out loud. To use the Q&A feature, again, remember, just simply type your question um, and we'll read it out loud for you. In order to get as many people um, as possible, we ask that you keep yourself brief and ask a single question at a time. After you finish asking your questions, you will be muted. And again, we want to pr prioritize hearing from as many people as possible. So feel free to ask additional questions through the Q&A function or re-raise your hand and we'll make sure to get to you. Um, to be fair, we will we will we'll allow everyone to ask a question before returning to anyone for additional questions. So I'm gonna start with the Q&A um, questions um, as we wait for people to join in um, through raising their hands. We look like we have a couple people who've already raised their hand, but let's start with some questions that we've already had in the chat. So the first question to you all um, and is, can you speak about a critique of this proposal that's only a giveaway to market rate condo developers? How is the zoning team change designed to create, zoning text, sorry, change designed to create change, but balance this with your existing neighborhoods? I don't know if Winnie, you wanna to try to take that? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, and I think for one element of the city of yes for housing opportunity is the universal affordability preference proposal or UAP. So if a developer wants to build a bigger building than what is already currently allowed under existing zoning, they would have to provide permanently affordable housing in order to have access to those higher FARs in order to build that bigger building. And as we mentioned in the proposal, Tonight, uh, affordability for UAP is going to be income averaging to 60% AMI so that we can reach a broader range of households, including New Yorkers who are not maybe currently being served by the Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program, which targets households at an 80% AMI. But we also want to note for the lower density proposals, the idea there is that it's unlocking potential for more housing growth, but also helping create more opportunities for more naturally affordable housing. The idea is that we're fixing um, our lower densities so that they can produce the two family homes that two family districts say they can, or the multifamily homes that low density multifamily districts say that they can under the existing zoning today. But because of these layers of restrictive zoning that have been added on in the previous decades, all of the development in these areas have primarily been like restricted to single family homes, which arguably is the least affordable housing type on the market. So through these different approaches, both UAP for the higher density areas, which will have this permanently affordable housing and the missing middle proposals for our low density suite proposals, we can create more naturally affordable housing to target a range of New Yorkers whose housing needs are not currently being served today. All right. Thank you, Winnie, for that. Let's go to the next question. Um, why not get rid of our one, two, three, and four districts, which are our lower density districts as described in the presentation, and use R5 as the basic building blocks of our city? These would be like Brownstone, Brooklyn, uh, and Queens, and basically what we all think of when we think of homes in NYC. Veronica, before you answer this question too, can you just clarify um, that if R5 actually is Brownstone, Brooklyn and, and portions of Queens? Um, I think many Brownstones are maybe, you know, are like medium density R6, or B, you know, districts now, contextual districts, but maybe in you know some cases, they're also some of the R5, R5Bs. 
uh, just for those of you the less maybe like familiar, I'll give broad strokes of these these you know letters and numbers. R ones and R twos are single family districts. The R threes, R fours, R fives are two family districts or low density multifamily districts that allow for small apartment buildings. Um, so I you know hear your enthusiasm for brownstones, but we don't all think of the same thing when we think of a building or a home in New York City. New York City is home to a rich diversity of neighborhoods and a rich diversity of housing types that includes neighborhoods with single family homes, small apartment buildings, two family homes, as well as obviously you know high density buildings. All of these places are different and valuable, but all of these places also need to add housing and have important housing uh, opportunities, which is why we've created a suite of well-tailored proposals that respond to all of these diverse contexts. So in the low density areas, those R1 to R4 districts that you've called out in the question, this includes some of the proposals that we walked through in the presentation, like accessory dwelling units for single family homes or two family buildings, uh, missing middle housing, like town center zoning or transit oriented development on appropriate sites, sites near transit, sites in commercial corridors. So we think that that'll introduce housing to those uh, R1 to R4 districts, as well as R5 districts, and uh, in appropriate ways, while also respecting the built character of, of our communities. Thank you, Veronica. I really appreciate that. And thank you for clarifying the difference of the districts. Um, Veronica, I think you might be able to answer this next question, too. Um, so there's $58 billion in construction and 260,000 um, new jobs. What are these numbers based on and how can we know that these this before each community board assesses its potential under the new rules? Yeah, great question. So the statistic that was cited on the slide about uh, the economic impacts of housing opportunity was developed by the Economic Development Corporation, EDC, using a, a you know projection of how many units could be created, as well as assumptions about construction's economic impacts on the city's economy. Um, but that was just sort of a, uh, I think, general estimate prepared by EDC. Um, we There will be a full environmental impact statement that will be uh, disclosed um, that'll have pro uh, projections of units um, by different neighborhoods so people will be able to fully understand the potential impacts and the impacts on infrastructure and other resources in their communities. But again, I just want to emphasize that zoning only controls what is permitted to be built. So we obviously... Um, many other things go into the both how much housing is created by this plan, as well as the economic impacts like those cited in that figure. Um, so, yes, we can't we can't know exactly what the answer will be, but that was just a rough estimate prepared by EDC. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I'm going to jump into um, some of the raised hands. Um, if we could please promote Nicholas Laveras. Hi, Nicholas. Hi. Hi, Hi thank you for the question. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, I, I just had a couple of questions about uh, um, those affordable units. Um, my my first question was, if you have one one single unit, would you still be able to get the height bump, or is it um, is it commensurate to the amount of of a floor area that you that you give? Thanks, Nicholas. That's a that's a great question. Uh, right now, the uh, the the more flexible heights would be available to any lot that contains qualifying uh, affordable housing, and that could be affordable, it could be supportive, or it could be senior affordable, or long term care facilities. It doesn't try to uh, you know prorate the amount of height based on the number of units uh, in the development. Hi, Nicholas. I think if if you have um, oh, sorry you can unmute. we're we're only doing one question at a time. Um, but if you if okay, you sure. want to just quickly, if there's a follow up, we can do. Yeah, just one one quick one. Uh, is is HPD going to uh, stay um, involved with this stuff in the same way that they are with uh, with a VIH? That's another great question. Uh, yes, I've been working every day with our colleagues at HPD. Um, historically, going back decades. City planning uh, and HPD have worked very closely together in creating and administering any affordable units that are created through zoning programs. Uh, the UAP program represents a pretty significant expansion 
of uh, the pipeline for affordable units created through zoning. And so, you know, for a couple of years now, um, we've been doing the work to prepare for what we expect to be uh, a real boon in affordable units after these, uh, after we um, enact these zoning changes. Okay, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. If you have more questions, just please add it to the chat or you can re-raise your hand. If we could promote um, Pedro Rodriguez. Hello. Hi, Pedro. Nice to see you. Hi. Uh, yes. So, um, so yeah, I'm Pedro. Um, and I, so I've been, uh, I'm, I'm part of my, my community board, community board six, and I've been part of a lot of Euler projects. Uh, well, I've, I've not been part of them. I'm more like, I've been to the meetings and I've listened to what the concerns that people have and et cetera, et cetera. Um, definitely one issue that I foresee the people are going to be complaining about a lot uh, is usually traffic and um Mostly just traffic. Um, a lot of people usually complain about like, oh, this developer's not adding enough parking, off street parking. That means they're gonna co cost more traffic because people look for parking. I am aware that that is not how that works, and that actually adding more parking actually causes more traffic. <laughs> um, but given, however, that that is a concern that's gonna be coming up, um, is there anything you can talk about? Um, any other tra any, well, talk about that concern that people are gonna be having, um, yeah. and also. Is the city working? Because I know the city is also pushing for, you know, bike lanes and things like that. There's currently the bus redesign uh, that the NTA is doing. Uh, are you guys are you guys in talk with the city about possibly providing more alternatives, especially to the lower density uh, par parts that are getting, getting, gonna be getting sung up zones? Uh, they probably don't even have a bus, but you know, bike lanes are cheap. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or is the city? Or are you guys not? Are you guys looking into that, etc. Yeah. Yeah, let's um let's take that. I'm not sure how, who on the team wants to take take it, sure. but I think that's a great I can, question. I can respond to that one. So, uh, traffic and parking availability are you know quali salient quality of life concerns for many New Yorkers. And through this proposal, we're you know looking to add a little bit of housing to every neighborhood, and we hope that will you know mean a little bit of housing in every neighborhood means there will not be the kind of stress on infrastructure or you know roadways that you might see if you were to add a significant amount of housing to a neighborhood which would of course require you know like in a neighborhood scale plan coordination with our agencies to you know our sister agencies to respond to those new infrastructure needs a little bit of housing in every neighborhood especially a plan that you know plays on some of our existing infrastructure strengths by adding housing you know in places that are close to transit and central locations means that we can hopefully help to minimize those impacts as i mentioned earlier we will be uh, we are conducting a full environmental impact statement which will uh, you know be uh, analyzing any potential impacts but in the essence of this proposal is to uh, not have dramatic changes or overtaxed infrastructure in any one location um, but just a little bit of housing in every neighborhood. Uh, as for the bike lanes and coordination about other kinds of access beyond, uh, you know, cars, um, it's a great point that I think, uh, you know, will require further coordination, you know, with uh, the Department of Transportation and other agencies that are in charge of, of those initiatives. Thank you, Veronica. And Pedro, if you have more questions, please use the chat or um, re-raise your hand and we'll make sure to get to you. Thank you so much. Okay, if we could go to Dolores Orr. Dolores, can you hear us? Yes, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, so I have two quick statements and then one question. I'm uh, disappointed to hear that everything is rental. I had hoped that the city would take on the philosophy back in the 1950s and 60s, where we had Mitchell-Lama co-ops. So it's not for profit. The carrying charges are, are to maintain the buildings without filling anyone's pocket, any, any landlord's pocket. So it's disappointing. You're not looking at home ownership in affordability. Uh, the other thing I want to thank you that I finally, for the first time, heard that ADU, basement ADUs, will not be allowed in Zone 1 floods areas 
I'm from Community Board 14 in Queens, and we are our entire peninsula and Broad Channel Island is flood zone one. So I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, we are also one of the 10 overburdened community boards. In the past five years, we have either had built or it's in the process of building 12,000 units on an island that is seven miles long, zone one, and a quarter of a mile in width. And there's uh, proposals for upzoning for another two to 3,000 units. So with this proposed changes, will there be a freeze that we will not have to absorb any more than the 15,000 units we're going to see added to our barrier island? Thanks, Dolores. Uh, those are some great questions um, and good to see you again. Um, yes, John. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll take them in, uh, uh, in order, I think, more or less, uh, which is, you know, land use zoning doesn't regulate tenure. So we're, it's not like we are mandating uh, rental apartments with these zoning changes, not by a long shot. Um, in fact, you know, we've talked to a broad range of stakeholders um, over the course of the last year plus. Uh, and, you know, some folks are are very excited about affordable home ownership. Uh, some folks are very excited about community land trusts uh, or, you know, new forms of public housing. You you mentioned things like like Michelama. Um, and some folks are excited about regular old, uh, you know, income restricted affordable rental housing. And the the key thing uh, to underscore here is that creating more of all those types of housing uh, requires zoning changes to enable a little more of it everywhere across the city. And I think one of the great byproducts, benefits of going so broad and creating as much opportunity as we will across the city is that you will see more of – Things like the community land trusts are more like affordable home ownership or more like this missing middle starter home uh, co-ops um, that are really, really difficult in a situation of extreme housing shortage where, you know, it often makes most sense to do luxury rentals or luxury condos or things like that. It has just the housing shortage has a real homogenizing um, impact on the types of housing that's built. And so that's why we're going for not only more more housing, but more types of housing too, to to fill in some of those niches that have gone underserved um, in recent years. You know, I've agreed with you in past info sessions too. Queens uh, Community District 14, you're right, it's up there in the top ten, um, despite being you know relatively far from from the city center. Um, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. City of Yes for Housing Opportunity is for neighborhoods like yours um, that have been, you know, arguably overburdened under the status quo. Um, that's a function of the fact that there are so many parts of the city where you can't build at all. And so by enabling uh, more housing in neighborhoods across the city, we will be taking pressure off of areas like yours, Community District 14, um, you know, areas of central Brooklyn, uh, you know, parts of the Bronx that have seen just tremendous amounts uh, of development under the status quo. So there'll be no official freeze or anything like that on development Community District 14. That's not part of our proposal. Um, but we do think that enabling housing everywhere, including areas that have been really good at excluding it, uh, under the status quo in recent decades will be helpful uh, in addressing some of the concerns that you have down in, in Queens Community District 14. Thank you, John. And Dolores, if you have more questions, please use the Q&A or the um, re-raise your hand and we'll get to that. Thank you. If we could promote Su and Chong. Hi, Su Wen. can you hear us? I think you muted yourself. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a few questions about the missing middle housing. Um, the first is, do you have an income level or a rental level that you're defining as naturally affordable? Um, the second question is, how many units are you expecting to be produced through the missing middle housing program? And also, how many units are you expecting to be produced from the low-density ADU program? 
and from the UAP program. I think you may have mentioned it in the past, but if you could just um, talk about that again. Um, and the third thing is um, for the transit-oriented development, you said that it would be limited to uh, lots facing a wide street or the short end of a block. And so I'm wondering about the short end of the block requirement. Um, is there any urban planning rationale for that? What was the reason for that restriction? Um, also in terms of determining the width of the street, um, we went through this for my district to, to see which lots would be affected. And it turns out that the city's street width database is full of um, non-exact street widths, like ranges of up to 10 or 15 feet that might be around 75, you know, plus or minus below and above 75 feet. So you don't know whether or not um, it meets that requirement. Some simply say greater than 70 feet wide or greater than 80 feet wide. So we don't really know which lots it applies to. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have an accurate database? Um, okay. I guess that's that's it for now. Okay, thank you. Um, Thanks. I can I can take, can take the that missing Monica? yeah the missing middle questions. So the first question was about affordability levels or what exactly does natural affordability mean? So when we talk say that missing middle housing is more naturally affordable than other housing types, that's not pegged to any kind of income restriction um, or like a specific. Uh, definition in, of what that income level is. But these types of buildings, a uh, modest apartment building has traditionally in New York City's history been, a, you know, serves as home for many, you know, working class, middle class New Yorkers. Um, and they've been attainable building types. They're very affordable to build and therefore more affordable for, for uh, potential tenants or homeowners. We do think that some of those building types will be at a scale. They'll have enough units that the uh, they'll choose to participate in voluntary affordable for, affordability existing affordability programs or perhaps future tax incentives and in that case there would be a, you know associated affordability requirements based on that that subsidy or incentive um this so it could in theory be luxury condos we don't think that these would be the type of building that would you know maybe perhaps be i mean i guess one person's luxury condo is you know it's that's also a you know term that does not have a precise definition but um, we think that these are going to be modest, simple apartment buildings that will be accessible or attainable for you know a middle income New Yorker. Um, so the next questions were I'd about. I'd just like to understand more about why you think that would be so. Is there a market study that shows that? Is there uh, based on you know like recent sale prices in certain districts or? Uh, recent Do I, I can hop states. in. I can hop in yeah. here and say what we're what we have in mind. So if you go back to uh, picture this 2005, you know, New York City, um, we were producing in lower density districts, a lot of like six, eight, 12 unit apartment buildings um, that were selling new construction in the 200 thousands in that for in that era i don't have inflation adjusted to today's numbers zoning changes that we made back then basically rendered those buildings illegal throughout wide swaths uh, of new york city and with it went a new construction you know missing middle type of housing that was a great starter home uh you know uh for people just starting out that was a great you know home for for uh immigrants coming to the city looking for immigrant uh, looking for uh economic opportunities things like that we just basically made it entirely illegal and so when we're talking about naturally affording missing middle housing we're talking about the successors to things like that um you know that's why especially with our low density missing middle proposals we're really talking about looking to new york city history sometimes it's back to the you know 1940s with a couple stories of residential above a commercial ground floor and sometimes it's looking, you know, to more recent history, early 20, you know, early 2000s, um, when we were creating this housing type that unfortunately zoning changes, um, you know, wiped from the face of the map. So I'll, I'll hand it back over to Veronica. But you're basing yeah. this on 2005 so I want to make, sure, I want to make sure that we get to other people too. So I, I definitely hear your questions and I think we need to, you know, we'll... I, I just want to confirm that what you're basing this on is 2005 data. Will you be basing your environmental impact statement on that as well? 
we do have data from that type of housing in that era, including cost construction costs, including sales prices, things like that. And we think it's a wonderful thing to inform our Will missing middle proposals. So thank you. Should we answer your other question? Yeah, let's go to the next question that Suwon had. Um, we're not, we, we definitely hear you and please like raise your hand again. I'm sure you will. Um, we, But I just want to make sure we get to your other question and get to the other people who have their hands up. I think the next question, or John, did you want to take it about urban design outcomes? And middle housing? Okay. And the yeah. So the ne next one was about uh, the urban design considerations of missing middle housing. And um, so we decided on these uh these site criteria, including street width and the short dimension of the block, based on existing development patterns in the low density areas, we, you know, did qualitative and quantitative research about those development patterns from before restrictive 1961 zoning, and found that it's quite common to see the apartment building on a short end of the block, or on a wide street with one or two family homes bid block. And so these rules, those aim to enable missing middle housing at appropriate locations. Um, so, you know, so there are opportunities for that housing while also, you know, blend again with the existing design context. You did mention that the you asked a specific question about street width data. Yes, there's, you know, the database is not necessarily reliable for every street, but there are existing zoning rules that are based on street width that DOB enforces. And they don't enforce these by using that database. They enforce these by, you know, examining the measure of the, the width of the street. And so um, the the unreliability of the database uh, won't affect the the enforceability of this this provision um yeah but right. I just yeah that gets that gets confirmed at the time of of permitting I was wondering how you'll be able to predict the number of units that's likely to result or where this is likely to to have an impact without accurate street width data or do you not intend to predict that no, we have an environmental review in process right now that uh, estimates a range of possible units throughout every neighborhood tabulation area uh, in New York City. And that incorporates uh, things like market status, you know, high market, low market um, in between. Um, it incorporates uh, zone, zone capacity, uh, for instance, and the building topologies that are uh, uh, possible um, in those areas. So we'll be publishing that. Uh, with those estimates before referral into public review. Um, so we don't have a finalized version of that yet, um, but we should shortly and, and it'll be made public. Thank you, Sue. And I, I we really, really want to be able to answer all of your questions, but we have so many people on this call right now. We want to make sure we get to everyone. So I want to go to the next caller or the next raised hand. Um, Layla. Uh, can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Good to see everyone. Um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, actually about the uh, FAR cap lift. Um, if I understand correctly, the announcement that uh, the uh, the state legislature and the governor made yesterday, um, the twelve FAR cap has been lifted. Um, can you actually speak to how that is going to uh, incorporate into the uh, city of Yes for housing opportunity? And then my other question is, have you made evaluation of the tax incentives and uh, any other subsidies that will be needed to implement the goal that you're trying to reach? Hi, Leila. Good to good to see you, too. Um, so the tax, uh, the FAR cap lift, the short answer there is that um, the cap lift, if in fact it, it happens uh, at the state level, um, well, just to back up a, a second, under state law, since 1961, uh, the city has not been able to zone above 12 FAR. That is, has not been able to zone in a way that allows buildings to be larger than 12 times the size of the, the lot that they sit on. It looks like as part of the broader housing deal, um, the state has agreed to lift the 12 FAR cap if a few things happen. One, if the city goes through a full ULERP in order to apply any zoning district above 12 FAR in the future. Uh, two, if that zoning district includes affordability mandates uh, in line with mandatory inclusionary housing. Three, not allowed to do it in historic districts. 
uh, not allowed to do it on sites with joint living work orders for artists um, and a few other restrictions. So the the short answer uh, with respect to housing opportunity, though, is that housing opportunity is not proposing um, to map any zoning districts above uh, 12 FAR anywhere in the city. So uh, housing opportunity uh, text amendments, it's just a text amendment. It's not a zoning map change um, if and when. Uh, we uh, propose uh, zoning above 12 FAR, that would be part of some future uh, zoning map change. So we're not proposing to do anything um, like that here. As, uh, but as for would, the, would the affordability level in the zoning tax amendment qualify uh, for the uh, affordable mandate uh, that the state law requires? That's a great question. Um, if and when we ever zone for above 12 FAR, it would be a mandatory inclusionary housing district. And so the requirements that apply to mandatory inclusionary housing areas would apply there. Um, you know, there are a few options um, that uh, have different set asides from 20 to 30% set asides of affordable housing um, and different AMIs from an average of 40 to an average of 80% AMI. And so if and when we ever map a district that goes above 12 FAR, uh, we would the, the city planning commission and city council would pick which MIH option would apply um, in that district uh, at that time. Right, and that would apply Wait, to new construction as well. Yes, yeah, of course. Uh, your next question was about tax incentives, I believe. Um, you know, as Winnie and Veronica laid out in the presentation, UAP, like all the affordable housing programs uh, in the zoning before it, is designed to work with a tax incentive so that they can work together to create, uh, you know, lots and lots of income restricted um, affordable housing. Um, we're excited that it looks like there will be a renewed tax benefit. Um, in the absence of a tax benefit, we would not have expected to see any mixed income multifamily at all. So UAP would have been helpful to the few 100% affordable housing projects that HPD and other government entities are able to, 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 to subsidize um, and finance. Um, but we wouldn't be getting anything um, from the privately financed um, uh, side. Um, and that's what's really necessary in order to hit those really big numbers uh, of, um, of income restricted affordable housing. And so we're provisionally excited that it looks like we will have a tax benefit that yes, we believe will work with UAP um, to produce you know record numbers of income restricted affordable units in the decades ahead. Thank you. Um, why don't we go to um, some written questions? We have quite a few in the chat. Um, so let's make sure that we can get to everybody in that. Um, so this question um, is about uh, infrastructure needs. Uh, with more people, um, this puts stress on the existing infrastructure in our communities. What are the plans to build more schools, more transportation, and other types of infrastructure? Yeah, great question. Um, so again, the Housing Opportunity Tax Amendment is designed to enable a little more housing across a wide geography, the entire city. Um, so in most cases, the local infrastructure can support the incremental additions to housing supply. Uh, additionally, while the text amendment seeks to enable a lot more housing overall, we expect a lot of it to house people who are already here, like unhoused folks, people in overcrowded situations, or families seeking a little more space. And these are folks that are already using our services today. At the same time, as John mentioned, we are conducting a complete environmental review to assess everything, including uh, schools, as well as like sewers, and working with other capital agencies to make sure capital investment goes where it's needed. So big city actions like this are really a good opportunity to look at infrastructure capacity. Um, and just to follow up to that, there's another question just about like um, how and how are schools going to be impacted? Are there new schools going to be built? Um, how would how are we looking at infrastructure issues on in that? Yeah, so schools are definitely a part of the environmental review. Uh, they were going to be releasing a draft environmental impact statement that will also look into impacts about available school seats and making sure we have enough resources for that. Yeah, we work closely with the school construction authority in the normal order of things and um, definitely uh, have been working uh, with them, especially closely around um, additional housing that might be created through the housing opportunity proposals. 
Thanks, John. Yeah, I definitely think we should highlight like this is a citywide effort. We're working with all of our partner agencies um, as we do with any project. Um, so there's a lot of great collaboration happening um, at the city. Um, I can't remember now if it was Veronica. Veronica, I think it was you who was talking about the um, basements and the flood area zones. Um, you mentioned about uh, how would, how this question is asking, how can you allow legalizing basements of flood prone areas? Um, we discussed this already with a, a recent person who was speaking, Dolores, but if you could just answer that again. Sure. So we're committed to identifying risk factors and using these risks to uh, identify how we can safely add basement apartments. Today's prohibition regime on accessory dwelling units, including basement apartments, leads to obviously unsafe outcomes, as weather events like Hurricane Ida tragically demonstrate. Um, so, the, so DCP, along with City Hall and the Mayor's Office for Climate and Environmental Justice, have convened an interagency working group that includes representatives from the Department of Buildings, the Fire Department, uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, et cetera, all to look at accessory dwelling units and specifically to look at basement apartments. So as Dolores mentioned, um, in the coastal floodplain where subgrade residential space is already disallowed in the zoning, there will be no basement apartments allowed. And in special coastal risk districts, which are the areas of the city most sensitive to coastal flooding, there'll be no ADUs of any kind allowed. But we know that stormwater flooding poses serious risks. And th those are sort of under-examined areas. So this working group is looking at stormwater flooding risks and will identify and recommend uh, few further regulations or review restrictions on basement apartments in sensitive stormwater geographies. Um, those will be you know, put out in, during the public review process. And we look forward to hearing from you know, basement tenants, uh, building owners, advocacy groups about these um, additional regulations. Thank you so much. Um, and staying in that vein, um, Winnie, um, if you could answer this one, um, given the effects of climate change, there are areas that are not currently considered in flood zone area, uh, flood zoned, flooding zone, <laughs> but do flood. Um, what is the city doing to push back against climate change? Yes, thank you for this question. Um, so if cities in New York City especially have radically smaller carbon footprints per capita compared to like less dense suburbs or rural areas. So the best thing that any city can do to combat like climate change is to promote greater density. And the city is also working hard to facilitate and implement better construction design to make sure our buildings and public realm and open spaces are greener and more resilient. Also want to mention, um, this is just one of three text amendments. An earlier text amendment, the first one, CBS for carbon neutrality, was directly focused on updating our zoning to make sure that we can have greener buildings and a greener um, energy grid. Um, and that's already passed city council, just so that's one of the more targeted text amendments focused specifically on how we can ensure that um, we can have a greener city and meet our uh, climate goals overall. Thank you. Um, the next question is about the HPD's area median income chart. Um, the numbers you are using don't, uh, don't seem to line up with the HPD's AMI chart. Your numbers are much lower. How, where do you get these numbers from? You wanna take that one? Yes, I appreciate um, your great catch on that. So for when we made this deck, uh, we were referring to the 2023 AMI levels. It looks like HPD has updated their website to reflect the new 2024 AMI levels. And as you've noticed, those AMI levels are a lot higher. Um, and it speaks to how overall, um, like for instance, the affordability levels that UAP will be replacing, 80% AMI is even higher now under the 2024 levels. So because of affordability programs that we're proposing through City of Yester Housing Opportunity, the universal affordability preference be targeting 60% AMI. Um, and again, I just wanna note that those units that'll be produced through UAP will be permanently affordable as well as rent stabilized units. So that's one way that will help address the fact that AMI levels will continue to increase in New York City. And when you look at that website, Website next year, those levels are going to be higher again. Thank you for that clarification. Um, staying on um, affordability, can you please define what you mean by supportive housing? Sure. Supportive housing is income restricted housing that provides a range of on site services for residents. Um, 
Now I'll go to uh, the next question. Would the text amendment encourage landlords of rent stabilized multifamily buildings to demolish their buildings and build new buildings that are 80% uh, market rate housing with 20% affordable through UAP? Great question. Um, so rent regulated units have additional protections offered at the state level. Um, so basically rent regulated tenants are guaranteed a lease renewal um, because they are rent regulated tenants. So there are additional layers prevent a landlord from demolishing those buildings. Um, and additionally, there are other tenant protection programs offered through like HPD. Um, for example, there's their certificate of no harassment program that ensures like landlords aren't harassing tenants to like get a, demol a demolition permit from DOB. Um, if there's any incidents of, you know, a landlord trying to harass tenants and there's that history, they there's a real process that they have to go through in order to get a demolition permit from Department of Buildings. So there's lots of angles both from the state and city level to ensure that there isn't landlord harassment of uh, existing rent regulated tenants. And so we don't anticipate that the city of Yester housing opportunity will incentivize um, that kind of behavior. And in fact, well, because of programs like UIP will increase more of the rent regulated units available. Thanks, Winnie. And just a, another question about UAP, so if you can answer this one as well. Um, can you please speak about the UAP program and the definition of permanently affordable as is, as as at its minimum? 30 years, please, uh, sorry, there was a comma in the wrong place. <laughs> it's at the minimum, 30 years. Please speak about what happens after this 30 years. How do we know that these units will really be permanently affordable? Yes, great question. Um, so just to make a distinction there between, I believe you're referencing how um, HPD's affordable housing projects usually have a regulatory agreement that is time bound. Um, but for UAP, they, these units will be permanently affordable and that will be enforced through a restrictive declaration that's approved by HPD and will be recorded against the property. And that identifies the affordable units and their rent and income restrictions and the restrictive declaration does not expire as long as that building exists and provides HPD with the right to enforce those affordability requirements. Great. So let's move back to some hands that are raised. Um, if we can promote Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan, can you hear us? Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, what is? Can you just explain to me what the approval process is like for something like this? How does? What is the timeline um, for uh, um, for when these rules would come into effect? I'm just not familiar with the process. So we will enter into a public review process. Um, that will kick off a multi-month um, discussion at the community board level, which um, is usually about a 60-day comment period, um, where the community board will hold a public hearing, and we'll it'll be at 59 community boards at every single community board. Um, and then the community board will submit a resolution um, that will be passed on to the borough president, the city planning commission, as well as city council. Um, once the community board and the borough president have held their public hearings, um, it gets kicked into the planning commission's purview. And there the planning commission will hold as well a public hearing um, and hear from people, which is usually, a, um, it can be virtual, um, a remote and in person. So you can come to both. Um, and after the commission has heard the testimony, um, they will evaluate the proposal in front of them um, and decide to make a vote. If they vote positively for that, um, uh, for the proposal, it will then go to the city council. The city council will also hold a public hearing, usually at one of their subcommittee meetings. Um, and we'll make sure anybody who signs up for our newsletter um, we'll have these dates available to them. Um, so the city council will hear the testimony um, and evaluate the proposal again. Um, and at that stage, um, there may could be some modifications. There could be, um, you know, uh, more conversations. But then the council does need to vote to be able to have this adopted into um, the zoning uh, 
code. Um, and before that, before we entered public review, we've been doing two years of conversations. We've had multiple years of info sessions like this. This one is giving them the most detail because we've been listening to people over the last two years um, to understand how we should shape this proposal to make sure it works for New Yorkers. Um, and that has really been the um, moment of experience for us to be able to shape it, to put it into public review. We do think we'll be um, entering into public review in, in the coming weeks, most likely. Um, and uh, we look forward to continuing this, these conversations um, at all 59 community boards, at the borough president, at the borough boards, and with our city, our city planning and um, city council. Okay, thank you. If we could go to Victoria. Hi, Victoria, can you hear us? Victoria, you should be able to turn on your microphone and camera. Hello, can you hear me now? Hi, Victoria. Yeah, we can hear you. Hi, wonderful. Thank you for having me. So uh, for many of us, we attended the MIH hearings before City Council, uh, where 92% of New Yorkers are vehemently opposed uh, to rezoning and the MIH plan, mm -hmm. where the City of New York during the pandemic has uh, attacked our industrial zones in Tribeca and Soho and the seaports where we found city planning is converting residential neighborhoods uh, to commercial in order to avoid uh, any, uh, avoid regulation. So that my question is during the city council hearings that approved MIH, Vicki Bean and Alicia Glenn promised us that they would use every tool in their toolbox between HPD, the DOB, uh, I, I could fall off my chair laughing over the non-harassment certificates that have not been enforced since Michael Bloomberg, where our, the issue is that the city's failure to enforce any of the laws or the mechanisms that you're speaking to uh, has caused developers to fraudulently convert 46 buildings in our case alone in Tribeca over the rebuilding of Lower Manhattan after 9-11, where none of the city records from uh, the Department of Buildings to the Fire Department, to the DOF, mm -hmm. absolutely not a single record adds up across the board. This is what Trump is on trial for. And so what I'd like to know is why in the world city planning would even consider uh, something so reckless while everyone is leaving and taking our businesses with us. We don't want this. And you don't seem to be hearing that we have lost all faith in government yeah. over what city planning is doing uh, during the pandemic. And so I'd really like you to answer the question because this is 20 years after 9-11 and what you're suggesting is not the history in a single residential neighborhood across uh, Manhattan, uh -huh. uh, acro across New York City, quite frankly. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Yeah. Let me, thank you let's, for having let's me. have John yeah, address that. Thank you, Victoria. Thanks, Victoria. Good to see you again as well. Um, I mean, why are we doing this? It just quite simply back to kind of first principles, um, we have right now probably the worst housing shortage that we've seen in New York City, perhaps in its history. I'm sorry, we, that we doesn't work for us. Move we, on. We certainly have the lowest. You are causing the housing crisis by rezoning to displace the middle classes. It is not democratic policy. So don't go there and skip to the next one. We already. So right now we have probably the worst housing shortage that we've had in New York City's history, certainly um, the worst since sometime before the population decline in 1970, uh, in the 1970s. 
And, uh, you know, as we 40% is... of all new Victoria? development is not occupied. Victoria, I really appreciate. I just want to make sure that John can answer so people can hear the answer to the question. Um, if you have more comments, can you please put them in the chat or you can re-raise your hand? I just want to make sure that we can get to everybody. Um, and I do want to, I truly want to address what you're, what you're asking here. I'm sorry, 40% of all new development is not occupied. MIH is a plan based on displacing its residents to not regulate a buildings down to build okay. luxury skyscrapers. So you're causing the housing crisis and the shortage. So answer the question, please. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to demote you now so that we can make sure we get to others. But we we absolutely heard your question. And John, can you please can you please go forward? Sure. Just right now, all indicators from every level of government uh, point to what is you know a historically bad housing shortage in New York City. As Winnie and Veronica noted, that's not just an abstraction. It has very real human consequences throughout the city for a broader and broader range of people. You know, it's not just the high rents, it's the gentrification and displacement pressure we see in many neighborhoods. Um, it's overcrowding, it's homelessness. And so, I mean, I think that the fact that the housing shortage, you don't have to like read the statistics, people feel it. Especially in recent years, it's really changed the conversation in New York City around housing so that I think just a wider and wider range of people understand that we are desperate to do something to address the housing shortage and those human consequences that emerge from it. You mentioned uh, vacancy uh, in uh, existing housing. Uh, HPD recently completed its housing and vacancy survey um, that shows historically low rates of vacancy, the lowest mm -hmm. since uh, 1968. Yes, there are some units out there that are vacant. Yes, it's really important that we uh, work with our sister agencies like HPD to do everything we can to get those units occupied. But we're talking, you know, tens of thousands of vacant units uh, in a city that requires hundreds of thousands of additional units to change the feel of the housing market, to create a housing market where people actually have options. So addressing any kind of vacancy issues and they are actually not historically high through, for any type of housing, whether NYCHA, whether rent stabilized or whether market rate, they're historically low. Addressing that's important, but it's only one part of just a multi-pronged effort that we need to engage in to provide additional housing and, and change the feel of the housing market to address the housing shortage. So thanks for your questions. Thank you, John. And thank you, Victoria, for, for your questions there. Um, you know, we'll definitely use the chat to um, the Q&A function to uh, ask more. You can certainly email us as well um, to have more conversation. Um, and please raise your hand again so that we can just make sure we're just hearing from everybody. Um, if we could go to Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Um, <clears throat> if we have so many empty office buildings in Manhattan, why can't we use those? Why do we have to build more buildings that are going to be causing, um, you know, traffic, congestion, noise in these peaceful residential areas uh, outside of the city? The great thought um and it's one that we share we think it's a, a great idea um the the proposals um, that we are presenting to you today include a pretty dramatic increase in applicability of our conversion regulations um you know today they only apply in manhattan below 60th street parts of brooklyn and queens along the east river a few other places we propose to expand them citywide we propose to change the cutoff date for applicability from 1961, 1977 today, all the way up to 1990, so that a more recent uh, tranche of um, vacant or underutilized uh, non-residential buildings can qualify. And we want to enable conversion to the full range of housing types, uh, including you know, supportive housing, including dormitories, um, including shared housing, things like that. Um, and we also got news 
today or yesterday, basically, that it looks like the state will come through to with a tax incentive to support affordable housing um, in conversions. Um, and if all these things come together, we're absolutely ecstatic about the win, win, win. Um, you know, we've got these vacant office buildings and other non-residential buildings. We desperately need housing. And a lot of these office buildings are in central locations where we would love to have more affordable housing as well. And so, you know, fingers crossed, it looks like uh, the stars are aligning and that we'll accomplish something good um, this year, you know, if, you know, we can get the housing opportunity proposals through as well. Thanks, John. Um, so let's do one more raised hand and then, you know, there's the chat, uh, the Q&A function has um, quite a bit of questions in there. So I want to make sure we're balancing this. If we could go to Robert Press, two. Hey, DCP team, is um, is Robert available? There are- He's be joining as a panelist. Okay, thank you. Hi, Robert, can you hear us? Can I have Mike? Robert, you should be able to turn on your microphone and camera. Robert, are you there? Yes, Robert, your mic is on. Robert, there, there's yeah. multiple Robert press. Yeah, raised it's hands. Possible. I wonder if it's he's using a different device. Possibly. All um, types oh, hi. hello. Hi. Hi. How are Hi. you? I don't know how that became Robert Press, but I'm Rochelle Manzina. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, I wasn't sure because mine was unmuting and I was just like is that for me or not but sorry about that sorry about that there's a there's a couple of roberts in there so if you um using a same if anybody else is using robert's uh, link please yeah. be sure to change your name or let us know or listen okay to yeah robert's i think that's it <laughs> I, I used his link that's correct yeah <laughs> okay. um okay my question is you keep mentionable mentioning affordable housing um as far as I can see, when I when you look up affordable housing, it's not really that affordable. But I'm worried about the affordability of 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 us homeowners, and I'm wondering if you change the zones, um, the zoning laws, and combine commercial and residential zoning. What's going to happen to the tax rates for the homeowners who who own single family homes? If my neighbor down the block decides to open a bodega on the corner, God forbid, what um, is that going to affect my tax rate on my home? Right. Great. Thanks for asking this question about property taxes. So first of all, I just want to clarify something that this proposal doesn't change any of the uses allowed on any particular site. So if your neighbor's not allowed to, under this proposal, build a bodega today, they won't be, you know, allowed to build a bodega tomorrow. Like they won't be able to build a commercial building if they're not already allowed to build a commercial building. This only affects places where residential is already allowed. You no, know, but that's the part time. of the zoning plan is to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's yeah. part of the zoning plan is to allow um, res uh, a, a corner house to now change what, what their home to a store if if you're on the corner. That's part of the proposal. We've heard it ten times. Okay, so I, yeah, I think you're referring to a proposal that's part of the different city of yes text amendment, city of yes for economic opportunity, which includes a provision for corner stores on certain sites. But that's part of a different text amendment than this one, one that has already been under the public review process. Um, so my answer was in response to the city of yes for housing opportunity. Maybe I'll answer the question about property taxes. And if anyone wants to tag on at the end with additional information about economic opportunity, they can do that. But I'm first going to answer your question about 
generally, how will this affect my property taxes? So property taxes are based on what's built on a lot, not what the zoning allows. So if you're not planning to add units to your building, this isn't going to affect your property taxes. Adding a single home, like an ADU, to a one or a two family home may lead to a small increase in taxes based on the assessed value of your property, but it won't bring you into a new tax class, um, which would be a major increase in taxes. So you, yeah, in general, shouldn't expect major tax increases. If someone wants to say more about the corner store provision, um, feel free. That's, so that's another team. So I just want to make sure, Rochelle, that if you want to put, um, send an email to um, housing opportunity at planning.nyc.gov, we can direct your questions about um, economic opportunity to the right team. Um, but we're going to talk about housing opportunities tonight. So let's go to um, some questions that we have um, in the chat. Okay, um, so these are kind of a series of parking questions. Um, so can you speak about how eliminating parking requirements impact communities that already lack sufficient parking spaces for residents? Yeah, great question. Um, so we've looked at other cities across the country that have already made their parking optional. And in many cases, housing is still being built and providing with parking where there is that demand. And that's already happening again in New York City today where there are some areas that um, don't necessarily require parking or uh, developers are providing more parking than what our current zoning requirements allow. So there is already that recognition that the market uh, can better put a number on how many parking spaces should be built with the development rather than inflexible zoning regulations. And again, we're recognizing that uh, when you know developments are going up that don't have parking, uh, the units tend to attract people who are looking for homes and not necessarily parking spaces. Okay, um, there's still some more questions just about parking. So um, if you could just speak a little bit more about if you're eliminating parking mandates, um, how will we deal with like parking shortages? Um, you know, I know you've said that, you know, that the market will still allow for it. Um, but if there's anything that you would want to add to it, just because we're seeing a lot of questions about parking. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we recognize that parking is tight in many neighborhoods, um, but zoning doesn't regulate on street parking. And like mentioned earlier, uh, cities that have already done with their uh, off street mandates and found that many developments still provide parking where it makes sense to do so. And the focus here again is like recognizing that currently our over regulated parking mandates um, have, are forcing a costly parking supply and expense of housing growth. Um, but we are not adding any new limits on the amount of off street parking that can be provided. And there are other shifts we're making in the text that are in the proposal um, to enable parking to serve as something more like a neighborhood resource to provide increasing flexibility um, for parking that already exists, say, as part of multifamily developments in the full range of zoning districts um, to be used, you know, by members of the public if it's not needed for the residents of that particular uh, building. Uh, even in the lowest density districts, we're simplifying and expanding our floor area exemptions for parking spots um, so that while even though we're not requiring it, <laughs> we're making it easier to provide when people want to provide it um, in terms of location uh, requirements, in terms of reducing conflicts between parking and housing on you know, sites of one and two family homes, things like that. Um, we're we're moving in, in that direction Um you know, this is just to say we're not anti-car. Uh, we just want to reduce those conflicts between parking and housing um, and enable, you know, sites when they do get developed to provide the amount of parking um, uh, that that folks think uh, will be necessary for the people who occupy that housing. Thank you. Um, OK, so there's more questions about um, tax programs. Um, so how or why would a developer voluntarily restrict the rent of a new unit, um, if a UAP unit, if there is no state tax program um, or low interest sources of funds to develop them, especially if the tenant protection provisions that preclude or severely limit rent increases over the time uh, of adoption? 
Yeah, great question. Um, so essentially, and this is something that we've noted in the draft scope of work for the Housing Opportunity Text Amendment, is that currently we anticipate that the full potential of how many affordable units universal affordability preference will create will be limited until there is a successor program to 421A. But in our conversations with uh, nonprofit housing developers or with HBD who are already building 100% affordable, we anticipate that they will likely take advantage of the UAP framework for those 100% affordable projects in our medium and high density neighborhoods. And because of the framework, be able to build more affordable units because they can access those higher preferential FARs. Um, but we are watching closely with our this is what's happening in the state to make sure, you know, if there are developments there, we can see definitely a lot more affordable housing being created if there is a successor program to 421A. Okay. Um, and then looking at single family home zones, um, how will City of Yes deal with single family zoned neighborhoods that have deed restrictions for developers? will be sued or forced to defend development by going to court or incurring legal expenses? Good question. Um, I'll take that as a as a former lawyer. Um, so the zoning controls what you can build on a site, but it doesn't reach beyond that to affect things like deed restrictions or processes external to the zoning, like Landmark Preservation Commission review uh, when required. So in the situation where, say, we're newly enabling missing middle housing um, in low density districts, if there's a deed restriction from 1892 or whatever that says it's uh, restricted to single family only, there's nothing that city planning would be able to do about that. And that's something that ends up getting adjudicated by the court system. So it's independent legal restrictions on the site that the zoning can't touch. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so let's do one more written question. Let's get back to some live questions too. Um, this one is um, asking about um, thinking about one family neighborhood still. Um, why are you um, what why are you looking at one uh, one family neighborhoods? They're the true gem of New York City and they represent American dreams. If you could talk a little bit about um, just how much we, um, do appreciate all the, the diversity of housing types in, in our city um, and what we're looking at, at, why we're looking at this as a citywide perspective. Yeah, as we've mentioned, you know, previously in the presentation, New York City, it's home to many different kinds of neighborhoods, many different kinds of neighborhood contexts. Um, but central to this proposal is that each of those neighborhoods needs to contribute to meeting New York's urgent housing needs, and that includes parts of our city that have single family zoning. That's why this proposal includes tailored approaches for all of our all of our districts, including our low density districts and single family districts. So in single family districts, which will continue to exist, there will still be single family zoning districts on the map in which the only thing you can build is a single family home. You would also be able to add an accessory dwelling unit which would be you know, an unobtrusive addition to the neighborhood context, but would provide important housing options for young New Yorkers, elderly New Yorkers, lower income New Yorkers, small housing units that would serve those households. Also on appropriate sites in single family districts that are areas that are near within 0.5 miles of transit, um, which is relatively limited in our single family districts, but do exist. Those areas would be able to add a transit oriented development building, a three story apartment building. Um, if there's a single family district, again, relatively limited, but a single family district mapped with a commercial overlay, they're actually already allowed nominally to build a mixed use building, but we would make that more feasible through the town center proposal. This just shows that every neighborhood needs to add housing and there are appropriate, well-designed housing proposals for each of these contexts. Thank you, Veronica, I appreciate that. Um, so let's go to Robert Press, maybe the real Robert Press this time, see? Is Robert Press three? Yeah, it is the real one. Hi there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't know if my question about the housing lottery, mm -hmm. that's uh, quote unquote affordable housing. There's one for the South Bronx on East 152nd Street, uh, which starts at $3,105 for a studio. There are eight available. $3,317 for a one bedroom, 16 available, and $3,953 for a two bedroom, of which there are one available. 
are these real affordable housing prices? And this is at the full market, full, you know, these are people who are getting uh, subsidies from the state because it ha anything that goes that way has to go through housing opportunity, we know. Uh, and, you know, again, from before, I'm just going to make a second comment on from before. We're at the same rate of uh, population as we were in 1960, which is what, 64 years ago? All right. So if we had enough housing back then and more housing has been built in the 64 years, how much have we lost compared to what was built then? Mm. So that's my two questions. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that. Be great. Uh, John? Great, great question. Robert, on the affordability levels, we completely agree. Um, you know, tonight you've heard about our UAP proposal, which takes existing voluntary programs, which just create units at 80% AMI and only 80% AMI, and pushes that down to 60% and enables income averaging so that we can get units, affordable housing at a range of incomes, including down to 30 and 40%. We're extremely excited about the evolution of our zoning programs um, for affordable housing. It's also why we advocated for a renewed tax incentive that creates truly affordable housing. And you may have seen at the state level, it looks like they have a proposal, an agreement for a renewed tax benefit um, that provides affordable housing in the 60 to 80 percent range we think that it's going to work great with uap to create a tremendous number of units at an average of 60 percent ami again from hitting 30 and 40 percent ami in addition the renewed tax benefit it eliminates the thing that you're talking about which was under the old program uh the developments in some parts of the city could qualify with units at 130 percent of ami the AMIs that we're talking about here in housing opportunity are less than half of that. You know, so we're extremely proud and very happy um, that our collaboration with the state seems to have paid off to ensure that if you're getting a tax benefit and if you're using the zoning program, you're getting uh, income restricted, affordable, um, you know, apartments um, at at, at, at rents that that families can that real New York families can afford to give you a. Just a, a hint. I was talking to HPD today um, about like two bedroom rents, a new new two new new construction two bedroom rental. Um, you know, we're talking about sixteen hundred to eighteen hundred dollars uh, for a new construction two bedroom, and that's something to be really proud of, I think, and something that that will serve um, a lot of New York City families that are struggling on the housing market today. So now, we agree with more, you. One more question, John. Robert, um, what's a, just give us a last question. I do want to, I want to do a time check. It's 8.20. Um, and so we have interpreters until about 8.30. Okay, so I want to make quick, sure. Where does the, well, well, these new buildings are going to have, if they take any tax subsidies or credits, they're going to have to have 15% of the building homeless, correct? Uh, those are HPD requirements that exist outside the zoning. So nothing in this proposal um, would provide for homeless set-asides. To get more information on that, I'd have to check in with my colleagues at HPD. Thank you, John. Um, let's take a few more raised hands and then we'll do a couple more in the chat. Um, we have 10 minutes left, um, but that does not mean this is the end of the conversation. This is going, we're gonna have much more conversations to come. Um, but if you would like to email us questions, housing opportunity at planning.nyc.gov. Um, if we could promote Susan. Hi, thank you. At the end Hi, of Susan. Hi, thanks for uh, taking my question. Two quick questions. I wasn't, you may have answered it, but I didn't hear it clearly enough. Will the upzoning that is being proposed um, take, go into effect in historic districts or not? Great question. Thanks for the question. Um, and just to clarify, um, the city of Esther housing opportunity will not affect any of our existing historic districts. Those will still remain in place. Any changes for buildings in historic districts will still need to go through those regular review processes. 
Um, and also to clarify, this is a text amendment. Um, so we're not, it's not an upzoning, those are map changes. So all of the existing districts that are in place today and the same FAR levels will still be relevant um, even if HO passes. It's just, just changing the text for the zoning resolution. Sorry, Susan, you're, you're, you're muted. Um, so, but we just, um... It was my que second question was, I heard one of the replies earlier about joint living working quarters for artists, but I wasn't able to hear the comment clearly. Could you just repeat, um, is that also connected to what I previously asked or was there something in addition? I had just mentioned them, Susan, um, because uh, the proposed legislation at the state level to lift the 12 FAR cap includes a series of exclusions, um, one of which is uh, you can't go above 12 in a historic district. Another is you can't redevelop any sites that have existing JLWQAs, Joint Living Work Quarters for Artists, on them. So I just mentioned them in that context. Um, nothing we're doing as part of these housing opportunity proposals really touches Joint Living Work Quarters for Artists. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if um, we could go to Joanne. Joanne, you should be able to- Hi, can you there hear you me? Go. Yes, we can. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. Okay, great. Um, hi. Um, look, uh, I appreciate what you're trying to do as far as, you know, balance the equation. Um, I do have a few, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a little concerned uh, that the end result of your quest, which is not the goal, obviously, but I'm a concern that the end result will be we'll have a lot of rich people and a lot of poor people and the middle class will be pushed out. Mm -hmm. The middle class is right now the, in New York City, we have only 15 percent of one family homes. Those 15 percent of one family homes are owned mostly by middle class uh, people in New York, in New York City, not including Manhattan. I'm talking about the boroughs now. Um, there's a few standard of living things that I'm concerned about. Number one, um, and maybe I'm misunderstanding and please correct me. So if I have a single family home and I'm a half a mile away from, uh, I don't know, one of the, uh, transportations, the train, um, you're telling me that if the person next to me sells their house, they could build a five story building. And if the person on the other side of me sells their house, they're going to build a five story building. Is that correct? Am I understanding that correctly? And if that is the case, because you changed the zoning, then you've affected my standard of living because now I'm in the middle of two big buildings when I came to this area or wherever anybody came to that owns a single family home because we want to be in a single family neighborhood, one or two right. family, not just single, two family, one and two family homes. This is the American dream. The American dream is not to live in an apartment. It's not. I understand that we need apartments, absolutely. My parents came here as immigrants, we were poor, we lived in an apartment building, yeah. I never wanna live in one again, okay? Yeah. So that's my feeling. Yeah, I, I, I worked that. very hard and I went and bought a home. Now I'm concerned that I built a home, I've spent a lot of money, I pay a lot of taxes mm -hmm. to be in a place where I feel that my children can play in the backyard. And that's important to me. And in a neighborhood that's tree-lined with other homes. If I wanted to live in the city, I would live in Manhattan. Now, there are buildings in my neighborhood, and they're near the train, but they're not coming all the way to half a mile up. And there are buildings, condos, regular buildings yeah. uh, throughout Queens. I live in Queens. Yeah. Um, but what concerns me is that that you're affecting the standard of living of the middle class with with complete disregard that not everyone wants to live in a building yeah. and not everyone wants to live in an apartment. And this bothers me because, you know, the city council prides itself in being fair and democratic. You know, I'm yeah. beginning to believe that you're only doing this for the poor, but you're hurting the middle class. The rich don't care. Yeah. Yeah. You're not bothering the guy living in the apartment in Manhattan making, 
you know, paying a hundred thousand dollars a month in rent in in whatever he's paying. So Joanne, so you're me, not bothering them. Yeah, I to- I completely hear you, and I I definitely one thing I love about New York City is that we can really have a choice, and want we want to continue that choice of people being able to have a single family home, a small apartment building, or live in a high rise. So um, why don't we why don't we address that? Um, I don't know, Winnie or Veronica, if you. Sure. Yeah. I'm going to start by clarifying the transit-oriented development proposal because you had some specific questions about your understanding of the proposal, and then I'll address your concerns about middle-income New Yorkers more generally. So first, for transit-oriented development, if you're in a low-density district and you meet specific criteria, you would be able to develop a a small apartment building. So those specific criteria are within 0.5 miles of a subway or rail station, located on the short end of the block or on a wide street, and that the site has to be over 5,000 square feet. So this means that, you know, only certain sites would be eligible, and we expect only a few sites in a given neighborhood would use these regulations to develop as, as, as an apartment building. These apartment buildings would also be three to five stories. So in the lower density districts, including our single family districts, that would be limited to three stories. So that's actually not really taller than a single family home could be in single family districts. Also, so just to respond to some more more general concerns, definitely hear you that it's incredibly hard to be a working New Yorker today. One of the main reasons that's incredibly hard is because of crushingly high housing costs. People have worked incredibly hard to get to be where they are today, but their children can't afford a place to live in New York City. They're still living at home. People are working every day and they're facing homelessness because of our crushing high housing costs. So by adding more housing and more types of housing, both low density options as well as high density options for whatever New Yorkers may choose, helps to meet those needs for people who are not able to afford housing um, today. So thanks. Okay, um, so we have one minute left um, in this time today, but we have much more time to be together again. Um, I would like to first off thank you all for attending. Um, this has been very fruitful. It's been really great to hear all of your questions. I know there's so many more questions, so I really do encourage you to use our email address um, to be able to uh, get other questions answered. It's housing opportunity at planning.nyc.gov. Um, if you go to our website, um, you can see more about this particular um, housing text amendment. Um, and that is nyc.gov slash yes housing opportunity. Um, I know that uh, many of you had questions about the other text amendments that we've been looking at. So our, um, our one for econo- City of Yes for Economic Opportunity, where we're very focused in on making sure we, our small businesses thrive throughout the city, um, as well as more of one that's directed towards sustainability and our climate change. So that was our um, City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality. If you are interested in learning about these two, they are on our website at nyc.gov slash city of yes. And you can see the whole suite of, um, of text amendments that are in front of, have been or are in front of our, um, in the public review in front of our community boards and city council and city planning commission. Um, we uh, encourage you to, on the website to sign up for our newsletter. That is where we will hear about more um, opportunities for uh, future engagement. Um, And we hope to see you all at um, the public review process. I particularly wanna thank Winnie, Veronica and John for being here today um, and for all of your hard work and all of the team that you can't see um, that behind the scenes um, that for being here today and supporting this important conversation. Um, Thank you all again, and we look forward to